Welcome all. Um, sorry that we uh, starting a little bit late. <laughs> Poor Michelle's had a bit of a uh, eventful af afternoon, early evening. Um, um, can people hear me okay? Uh, just put it in the message or um, put your... Um... Great. Thank you. I'm just going to switch my phone off because it has a tendency to make odd noises every so often. Mm. And then we will start. There we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if um, people could, um, hopefully people are muted, but if, if um, everyone who's not asking questions or anything like that can, um, can mute, that would be great. Um, just to introduce yourself, myself, I'm uh, Yoni Ejo and I'm an adopter. Um, I'm an adopted adult. Um, I was transracially adopted at 18 months old. Um, and I'm also a social worker and um, social work manager and adoption coach. And I'm doing some of the, these masterclasses because I strongly believe that um, we need as adopters and um, special guardians and foster carers, we need as much information as we can possibly get um, and the best practice really. And so it felt like something that I really wanted to um, offer to um, people. So huge welcome. And I'd like to introduce um, Michelle, who's going to talk about life story work and life story books. Michelle has a diploma in social work, social work and in therapeutic life story work. She's been a panel advisor, a fostering practice manager and supervised social workers. Um, and um, she's worked with children with complex needs and assessment, duty and assessment. Very, very experienced. It's lovely to have you. Um, um, because there's quite, it's, we've got a limited amount of time, um, I'm not going to ask people to introduce themselves, but if you could put in the chat whether you're an adopter, a foster carer or a special guardian or professional, that would be immense so that we... Um, we know who's who's here and um, I will hand over to Michelle and hopefully share my screen. Yeah, because I'm useless with technology. So <laughs> one of the things I need to get much better at, I think. <laughs> um, yes. Is that showing? Yeah, yeah, that's showing. OK, I'll just do it from the beginning, hopefully. So I just need to, um, might need to let people in. Okay. Actually, Michelle, if anyone come, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, um, I'll let people in if, as I can see them, hopefully. Okay. All right. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. So Jan has already introduced me, but again, I'm Michelle and I'm a therapeutic life story work practitioner. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I'm nervous. I'll tell you that. Not a thing I often do, <laughs> something like this, but it's very exciting and I'm glad to be here. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of just, you know, talk about the therapeutic life story work really and the therapeutic life story work model. And so the training I did was with Richard Rose. And um, he's written quite a lot of books on life story work and undertakes life story work himself. Um, so I just thought, um it, it it would be good to think about your day um and just if you've got a pen and paper handy just just write down you, what your day was like today what went well today what's not gone particularly well today this is quite apt for me because <laughs> it was all right this morning but you know this afternoon coming with a flat tire just getting off the motorway and realizing your tire one of your tires is down to 85 when it's meant to have 200 of whatever it's supposed to have in it air i presume that's what it is you know realizing that and realizing you've got to pump up your tire in order to get home um so and then think about what have you got left over from your day 
And are you still thinking about that? Are you still thinking about what's left over from the day? And, and how does that make you feel? Having that left over from the day, something that you've not resolved or something that's gone particularly well. And then just hold those thoughts because I'm going to come back to those in a little while. Okay. You want me to move on? If, you, if you've written down what you need to write down, then I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. And the next slide just has my questions on Yoni, so you can skip that one. <laughs> Go on. Okay. <clears throat> so life story work it's a, a trauma-informed intervention and it takes between nine to twelve months it's about 18 sessions and it's for children that are age five to 18 plus and I think there's uh, more research at the moment that we're looking at um, care experience that adults wanting to take on and, and, and do pieces of life story work around uh, their journey and their experiences um, the Stylist life story work that we do is always done with the primary carer and the um, life story work practitioner um, works alongside to support the child or the adolescent or the young person to make meaning of their life, exploring that and in forming a coherent narrative around that and understanding their emotions and behaviours, gain choice and, you know, to have control over and master their own emotional expression and their regulation and co-regulation also, you know, alongside their carer. To build meaningful and safe relationships, connections and, and attachment with your carer and to be able to form those attachments with other people also. So that's what we aim to do when we complete a piece of life story work with a child, adolescent or young person. So it, it comes in three stages. Um, so for us, if you go into the next slide, you know, um, there's an information bank. And the information bank really is, um, you know, looking at the information that's available. That just doesn't come from social work files. That comes from people, significant people, members of the family, um, thinking about what else is um, kind of available to look at, to... Uh, build that information bank and for us really it's the sense around you know thinking about what we already know what what we don't know how we're going to fill those gaps who's got the information to fill those gaps what's safe to share you know what can we share with the child at their age because we've got to meet the child where they're at when we do the peace of life story work also and then thinking about you know what would the child want to know about their life and their life story work. So, you know, thinking about what their experiences are and what they would want to know from us. And really it's around the quality of that information bank. It, it's really important because you need to know more information as the life story work practitioner than the child does. Um, and your basis of understanding of their life needs to be a really good. Hence the information bank is a really important part of that work and starting that work and also it's um, moving forward and being able to share with primary carers uh, and the child that information and also say other alternative carers that might look after the child. The second stage is around internalising that information and we use wallpaper to do that where we chart information onto wallpaper and we're um, external it's so so we're bringing all of the information together and we're doing that through play and probably moving forward on the slides a little bit quicker okay. than perhaps I'm asking you to move now. <laughs> so it's like um, you move on to, there's another oh, one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've, I've moved too quickly, it's me. <laughs> I'm speeding ahead. Um, no. So it's dealing with, you know, the feelings around the child in a life. Um, and, you know, thinking about that we don't always have to agree with the child's narrative. It might be incorrect, but that's their narrative. So, you know, we, we have to listen to their narrative and then we have to look at, you know, what information is around that narrative to share that narrative in a way that 
where the child's able to externalize that information and then be able to internalize that because children need to be able to express their own views before they can internalize that information themselves and so the wallpaper does that because we put all the information on that wallpaper and that's to help the child reach a stage of understanding and to look at reframing what's happened for themselves and problem solve some of the things that have happened in their lives for for themselves so michelle do you mean literally wallpaper yeah literally wallpaper <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah literally wallpaper and and like you know pretty um i haven't even got any in the shed i've got a case for the wallpaper but no no wallpaper in the shed i'm afraid but like the the most thickest denier of wallpaper is what we use because we kind of roll it out and roll it back and walk all over it and do all sorts with it so it needs to be pretty bo robust really but that's basically what what we use we just use wallpaper um so i think thinking about that in, internalization um if we think about kind of the foundations for some of the work that we do um, and some of that is around bulby we move on to the next slide yeah he used the term internal internal working model and it's how that internal working model is split and it's um, looking at the self and you know having a perception of the self a perception of of others and the world um, and just thinking about you know that we all need those connections don't we we all need to build relationships um and it's thinking about you know when there is a, a stressor or a threat that we need um, other people to help us to manage those stresses or um, that threat or that problem and so you know if it is that we we either seek or we avoid um, situations so it's like thinking about the past experiences and how that will impact on the self and you know what's happening for that child within that situation and so when you're thinking about the self you're thinking about a child needs to be loved and we need to show children that they're worthy of love and we need to make them feel that and to feel that they're worthy of that love um, and then you know when you look at when you're thinking about others it's looking at what's happened to that child what's happened in their early experiences and and how that impacts on them so how their care needs were, were met by other people is then how they view the world so the world can either be a safe place or a dangerous place and what we're looking to do with the life story work is is to make them feel safe so that they can express their self so that they can externalize in order to internalize the information and they can look at that narrative and think about how that narrative can be a different narrative for them. So within that, we're kind of looking at what drives the child. And this is um, a quote from Falberg. Um, and it, you know, it says the very fact that adults hesitate to share information about the past with a child to him that his past is so bad that they won't be able to cope with it. Whatever the past was, the child has lived through it and survived. So they can live with the truth and the truth can be presented in harmful ways that lowers the child's self-esteem or in a way that helps the child to understand that accept his past and thus raise his self-esteem. And I think that's one of the, the, the go-to quotes in, um, in, in the work around life story work um, with Rich Rose. So it's looking at, you know, what drives the child, thinking about, you know, their present issues, present difficulties. We don't, people often ask, you know, um, is it re-traumatising for children to have life story work? But our concept is, is to do no harm. So what we're doing is, you know, we're sharing that information with the child because, you know, they've, they've already lived through that and they've already survived that particular situation so it's like presenting the truth and everyone has a story within that 
within that information. So everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has their own story and you bring in everyone's story into the Peace Life Story work. Richard talks quite a lot about the ghosts and the monsters that live inside of us um, and listening to children's perceptions and kind of valuing their experiences. Um, we, can, we can look at labelling what the past ghosts were and what the monsters are also inside the child. And with the carer, that helps to promote the child's best interest. Everyone okay? <laughs> it's really interesting. Are people okay to ask a question if they've got one, Michelle? Somebody's put their thumb up, so Lynn's okay. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> Oh, someone's got their hand up. Is it Hello. Helena, yes. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little bit late because uh, bedtime. <laughs> um, so I, um, can you just repeat for me? This work you're talking, we do, who does it and when? You, so you know, all this, yeah. So the, the model I'm talking about is the therapeutic life story work that's mm -hmm. taken with a therapeutic practitioner and a carer. So the primary carer for that child normally undertakes that work. That's that's not to say that um, there are not other ways for people to do pieces of work with their children. So there are things like, you know, all about me books and looking at the mm -hmm. present and what's going on in the present that's all about me I would say that you know whilst you know life story work is is really important and 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 some children really need that um, mm -hmm. you know that there are other children where if you were to chart their lives with a um an all about me book and you were to do that all about me book um frequently enough you would have quite a lot of information about them in their present and, mm -hmm. and you'd be looking at their future also wouldn't you um yeah you might not you might not have the information then about the past but what you would have is information about the present and information about the future yeah. so in particular now i'm talking about therapeutic life story work and that model okay thank you very much so if you move to the next slide Ioni, please so this slide is just about, you know, child brain development and kind of looking at, you know, the stages of that um, and how and what children need um, in order to kind of move through those stages. Um, and I suppose many of us can um, think about our own lives and um, our own childhoods and things that have happened to, the, to us and um, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to know isn't it whether or not you know that information because someone's told it to you so many times or whether you actually recall that information yourself so whether it's an unconscious thing or whether it's a conscious thing it's that so and and over the passage of time stories change and move don't they uh, things get added and things get taken away and it's kind of just thinking about that um, so when we have children who live with alternative families um, and not, who are not their birth families and who have lived in a number of family situations, they often don't have those people around them to recount stories, you know, from, from their childhood or from their past. And so for those children, they might have emotions and feelings and they might understand things very differently. And, you know, and that's what impacts on their, you know, internal working model and the mistrust of adults. Um, and they're feeling that the world's not safe and if we think about that you know if we think about the fact that you know trauma is um, a series of events that occur and you know how those events impact unless you can change that narrative continues to impact on on people when they've suffered trauma so it's just thinking about how to do to develop and support children with the, some of the shame that they have and some of the blame that exists and um, some of the feelings of um, sadness and badness that are around and looking at you know the misconceptions and how they get wired into the brain 
Um, and one of the, again, one of the key aims of the life story work is to provide that narrative and to help the child understand their history and the impact of that on their behaviour and for them to understand that it's not their fault um, and that they're loved and they're lovable and, you know, that they deserve better parenting and that, you know, adults can be trusted. Um, and, you know, finally to think about their hopes for the future, really, you know, what what their hopes are for the future, what their carers hopes are for them in the future. So if you move on to the next slide, it's just understanding, you know, your child's behaviour and thinking about, again, how certain traumas and certain things that have happened might increase aggression, distrust, um, and, and how those things impact. And once children have moved even to a safer environment, their brains and bodies might not recognize that that danger's passed. Um, and that these habits that they, that they have, these behaviors that they have, um, you know, they're, they're protective and um, it's retraining some of those things so that we can, you know, we're not in survival mode and actually we're able to make children feel safe. Can we move on to the next slide? So this is just about just emotional regulation and some of the things that people might do with children to, you know, calm down. I'm sure you've all got your own um, ideas and things that you might do with your children at work or that you know other people do with their children at work. It's just thinking about, you know, how to prepare yourself for, you know, the times when that, because um, I could, <laughs> I think of it, I think of the, the brain as the, the middle part of the brain being like the fire alarm. So that bit going off and having to, you know, implement some support around the child in order that they can regulate themselves. And often, you know, um, carers are the people that have to be that, they have to be that, that person to, to support in those situations. And it's, you know, how you would kind of do that and some ideas around how you might want to do that and you, you may have your own um, and I just wanted to show you so if if I, what I want to ask is um, that no one takes any pictures because these are actually pieces of, of children's work that I've got next so I, I kind of don't want anyone to um, be taking any pictures of them I hope they're the right way around because the way I've printed it out doesn't look like they are Oh yeah. So I worked with um, a young girl who um, had experienced um, the toxic trio, so um, drugs and alcohol at home, um, domestic violence and um, mental health. And so um, there were lots of um, situations in school where um, she would be pulled up for particular situations where she was using, say, the wrong language. Um, and so we kind of looked at the brain and how, how the brain works. I'm not a great drawer, so <laughs> I can't draw really good stuff. So I just kind of... It, 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 it just was we just drew it like this and we just talked about the fact that you know the bottom of the brain develops first and um often that can be about surviving certain situations where your needs are not being met in the home and that the middle part of the brain is around your emotions how you might feel um the senses and then the top of the brain is the thinking brain and how sometimes when children are in situations whereby their needs are not met, they're not able to develop all parts of the brain 
and then sometimes language um, isn't what others would want language to be and um, this particular young person really did struggle with being able to use um, good language we'll call it not language that people would be offended by maybe um, and then if you just flip to the next slide I hope I've got that in the right order. Yeah. So in order that I wanted to know that they understood what I was talking about, this is what they drew to explain how their brain worked and how they understood what we talked about, that that was impacting on their feelings and therefore it was a impacting on them being able to make decisions and also it was in impacting on the words that they used because their brain hadn't developed in such a way that they were able to use all the same words that everybody else used. So when they were unable to, to express themselves, instead they would use a swear word. And, and they knew they weren't supposed to use a swear word because what they would say, I would say, well, explain it to me. Well, then I'm going to have to swear. And I would say, well, then swear. But you shouldn't hear me swear. But that's all right because you're not swearing at me. You're explaining a situation and if you have to use that word in this session then use that word because if you, that's how you if that's the only way you can express yourself right now then just use that word so um yeah so that was just a, a bit of support to kind of explain that so play is really important in in the work that we do so in terms of um the sessions and the wallpaper, it's all about play with the child. It's its all about playing. Um, but if you move to the next slide, because first, oh, sorry, the next slide, I've made a boob there. Yeah, so if, if we think about the, the exercise from earlier and we think about how often we're preoccupied with things, this is a child example of their preoccupation all the time. So initially, the one in the top right-hand corner is how they were feeling. So mum was quite a big part of what was in their brain. School was another part of what was in their brain. And that small thing, I can't read anymore, um, was in their brain. And then there was a bit at the top of the brain, which wasn't labelled, if I remember rightly. And then over time, if you look at the one at the bottom, it became school was quite... A big thing revision was quite a big thing mum became quite a small thing and me time then started to figure in and became quite a big thing for the child so it's about you know thinking about some of the things that that can that can preoccupy children and children's brains some of the things that perhaps they might worry about be concerned about so initially mum was a big thing to be worried about because um, um, he was worried about um, where mum was. This was a, a male worried about where, where mum was, uh, what mum was doing, didn't know where mum was living, didn't, hadn't seen mum for a while. And so mum became a, quite a big worry, um, wondering about where mum was. And then I think um, the particular uh, part of the preoccupation that he did at the bottom was around well actually um I kind of I kind of think mum's been sighted here and um I kind of know where she'll be staying if she's been sighted there so I'm not worried about her anymore even though I've not seen her and she's not seen me um I'm not worried about her anymore because I kind of know where she is and if I wanted to I would go and knock on that door and um say hello to mum so mum became quite a small thing but it but it's quite interesting, isn't it? In the in the exercise that you've done earlier on, were the things that you were that you've been preoccupied with from the day? Because I know probably in the back of my mind is the fact that I've got a car out there where the tire might be gone down by the morning, and I'm probably going to have to go and pump it up again. So it's like, what is it that kind of preoccupies your brain? If we think about children who've experienced trauma, there's a lot that preoccupies them. There's a lot of things that, um, you know, that they, that that they, that that they know, but they, but they might think they're responsible for. There's a lot of shame around, a lot of badness, and the monsters and ghosts, you know, sometimes can be 
quite heightened in in those situations where children are feeling preoccupied by other things so it's quite hard to concentrate on the things that they might need to concentrate on like their education and being a child and making friends and playing out <laughs> yeah. so any questions about the bits that we've just done I suppose it um I'm wondering how much of this could you do as like a carer or a parent um yeah how much of it is safe safe to do I suppose people get, get quite anxious about talking about life and yeah I think I I think play is 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 kind of a big thing you know being able to to kind of play with your child um looking at understanding their emotions understanding um how they feel when they're angry how they feel when they're happy how they feel when they're sad and kind of letting them sort of understand how you feel because the life story work journey is you know the care is involved in the work and I'm involved in the work as well you know I, you know, you have to share some of your, you know, some of some of your stuff in the feelings work as well. Um, I mean, some of the play things, Jenga is a big go to for us. Um, the Jenga game, you can put questions on a Jenga game um, that children have to answer questions when you're pulling a Jenga piece. Um, there's like emotion cards. If you flick onto the next slide, because I think I've, I've got some of the little bits that you know the next the next slide sorry so it's like um so like mood boards and collages and worry trees with children because what you're wanting to do is um prompt conversation from conversation you'll be able to understand things that are impacting on the child and with that you know you you'll be able to go back if you're if you're a carer to say a social worker for them to kind of get that bit of information so that you can then share that with, a, with the child in an appropriate way. We always start where the child's at. So understanding how they're feeling and their kind of feelings um, is, is a really important thing because we need to know, you know, how they're feeling through the work. And through the work, what, what we tend to do is we tend to ask them to kind of name their feelings onto the, to the wallpaper as we go through each part of the work. Um, I mean, one of the other things that um, people do is things like welcome mats. So like, you know, using art to draw like a welcome mat of your home, you know, um, what, your, what your home's like. Um, and you can use welcome mats in so many different ways because you can think about welcome mats for the past. Well, what was it like in that home? Um, or you could start with, what would you like your future home to be? Who's going to be there? Who's going to live in it with you? What's it going to look like? So you could start with the future, then look at the present, and then, you know, start thinking about, you know, little bits of the past by using, you know, just, just little welcome mats that you draw yourself with the child. Um, trying to think of some other little bits, because yeah. Johnny's come up with a good a good question there how do you you start little bits of the work so like um so when so when a child's moving um or or has moved or if you're talking about moves you could actually make a uh like a box and decorate it um and you know kind of turn that into their home what would they take with them what prized possessions would they having this home and um yeah you know looking at are they going to be married are they going to be single are they going to are they going to be cohabiting are they going to be you know all of those things you can kind of you know just talk about and it just gives conversation doesn't it and then you can you know the the bits that you know about the past sometimes you can put some of those little bits in to kind of you know start a discussion about something else that you want to start a discussion about but you're doing that through play 
So you know very quickly you can um, take your child back to the safe place to something else if you're doing it through play. I was just going to um, say something that um, I know a lot of social workers find really useful. It's a resource um, called, and, and I think it's Social Works Workers Toolbox. Um, and it's a website. I'll When I send out um, emails, I will put it at the bottom. Um, but I think it's socialworktoolbox.co.uk, I think, probably. Um, and that's got a range of direct work, um, um, sort of discussions and things to generate, um, things that young children can copy or fill in. And I know a lot of my colleagues use those quite a lot. I've been looking at that myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard of that. I've been looking at that myself. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking you could, you know, um, Using glitter, make like, you know, jars and um, use different colours to represent the feelings. Because when the, the glitter jar is settled, all the feelings are settled, aren't they? But when, you know, you become dysregulated or upset, the shaking of that will mix up the different colours and the different feelings. And it's a good visual representation for a child, isn't it? Mm. I know somebody else uses a... Um, salt and chalk and then puts it into a layered um see-through jar as well to also represent the different feelings and how they all get merged in together and mixed together inside people um, and that's a also a good visual representation for children to sort of look at and understand feelings so there's no expectation that you know they're bad because they get angry or they get upset or they become aggressive you know we have to work through our feelings and it's how you know we have people there to support us to work through our feelings um, but yeah play play is a play is a, is a real big one because I think it's um it, it, it's one where you can um you can always we always bring the child back to uh playing a specific game um you know all kinds of games hangman all sorts of stuff Jenga whatever bringing the child back when you've done something that's particularly um, difficult or requires quite a lot of their attention or um, you, you might be giving challenging news or difficult news and it's just bringing them back to that game before you sort of move on again. And I think, I think that that that's the end, really, of what I kind of wanted to say. I didn't put the end on my on my slideshow, did I either? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was just checking whether we got some. Yeah, we've got some questions. Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> cause, sorry, because I was sharing my screen. I couldn't see see any of them. Um, so we've got um, Rachel, who's an adopter, Lisa, who's a doctor and social work assistant, um, Lauren, adoption support worker, um, newly Alex, newly qualified social worker, well, um, and uh, family practitioner. Sorry, I can't see your first name there. Be Becky is a family practitioner, and um, Caitlin is a social work assistant. Um, Lynn works um, in, in adoption and undertakes life story work. Um, are you um, able with the proviso um, of not um, the photographs of, of children's work, but would it be okay to um, um, send out the PowerPoints of the information? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah we, without, those, without those bits in it. Absolutely. Um, and I've got another question. I, d I don't know if this was explained before I managed to connect, which, um, what ages are we talking about? Or in other words, how early can you start 
is this work appropriate for a three or a four year old? We or... we say five. Five. We say right. five five to eighteen plus. Right. What sort of discussions could you have with a child early, earlier than that? I think that would be um, an, a, all about the ebook, really. I think you'd be right. looking at, you know, the child now in their present. You'd be looking at their present information and what's going on in the present and making having a real understanding of, you know, how they feel in the present and then looking at doing the life story work at the kind of level. Okay. Um, the all, all about me book. Um, I know it is in the social workers toolbox box, so I will um send out that link. Um, but it it's generally about things asking the child lots of questions about different aspects of their life, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Um, but it's a bit structured, so it's quite helpful. Yeah. Um, it's something you do with your your primary care as well. You know, it's not something you're expecting the child to do on their own. They're going to do that with their primary care. Right, okay. Um, do you um, meet or, or work with patient parents um, first? How do you ensure parents aren't leaving, leading or correcting the child's narrative? <clears throat> um, I think um, what, what, what we tend to do is um, we would tend to have a meeting with um, anyone who's undertaking the life story work alongside us just to explain what it is and how we do it and then prior to sessions what what I've tended to do is um, run and explain what I'm going to talk about in that particular session so that so that we're clear about you know what we're discussing um, how that's going to be discussed um, and you know if if there was ever a feeling that people are correcting then we would add have that discussion in the pre in the preparation for the next session again just to say you know um that's the child's story and everyone has a story and you know you have to listen to what they're saying also because that's their story absolutely and um alex has asked what kind of approach would you take for a teenager Similar, similar approach to be fair um you're kind of you're you're kind of still you're kind of still building that trust with a teenager you know um and it, and it and and a lot of it is 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 about is about building that trust i mean i've worked with um a young man who um you know we 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 did the script of if i'm late i'm going to be a carer and um, I was late one day, so I stuck on the motorway, and um, he, when I arrived, never came out of the room, and um, um, he didn't want to come down to the session, but the proviso is, I'm here for an hour, and I'll stay for an hour, regardless of whether you come downstairs or not, so I just, I'm always prepared, my book was ready, and I sat with my book, and just read my book, just went upstairs, said hello, said I'm here sorry I'm late I'm gonna go downstairs and I'll wait for you to come down and he came down um five minutes before the end of the session to test no 10 minutes before the end to test me out so we did five minutes work and then I packed away and he was like oh she really is gonna leave on time um so it's it's building that trust with a teenager in order that they're able to get into the work and I just use lots of playful things because like I just use my inadequacies so I can't draw so I draw stick men and most teenagers don't want you to draw stick men on the life story work so they either get involved start drawing or we look at other ways to make their life story work look a little bit better by using magazines and things like that so it's just about you know bringing meeting them where they're at and you know getting them to sign up to the work and you know it it's it's about them and it's about um them being able to have that narrative for themselves around their life and understanding that everyone has a story and that all of that information will kind of be presented and you know yeah i don't 
it, it you know it 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 all it, it works the same because the the bottom line is is building that trust and building that relationship with with that young person. Yeah, and I'm mindful that it, that's quite difficult sometimes, isn't it? Like, particularly with teenagers who've been in care for a, a significant time just because they've had so many different people come in and out um so being consistent actually you're on you're you're um, doing a lot better than many um i think Carthy um asked hi yoni and michelle thanks for a great talk i was just wondering how most people access um life story is that life story work i'm presuming is it something recommended for all ad ad adopted children? Ooh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Isn't it? Mm. That's a real tricky one because um, I can't... Can, can I... Go on. Can you, I, can you, I you, ask you that? that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my my um, work... Um, the, my, my main job is as a children's social worker at the moment in a looked after child um, team and I have to say that there is a there is a standing expectation that all children and young people have life story but work done with them however that isn't always what happens um, I think if it's it, it's probably true to say that most adopted children get some element of life story work but I think it's quite um changeable in terms of how how in depth that is how meaningful it is who does it and 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 I think sometimes as an adopter I wish I'd taken ownership of that whole part process um at the beginning of the adoption and 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 had those discussions throughout because um i think it would have saved us a lot of challenges come teenage years when um particularly one of our daughters just didn't have very much understanding of her life history and it was only when we met um and that was partly because we didn't have the information um and and the life story book that she did have wasn't that helpful um so yeah i think it's quite changeable and and can't always be left to local authorities if i'm honest um eleanor you did have a hand hand up a while ago i'm presuming that's a legacy hand um if not do uh, in interrupt me um amy um as adopters how best would it you be able to access the support to have a practitioner run through this life story work with you or your children <clears throat> that's um that would that would be through funding from adoption support fund wouldn't it that yeah that's, that's how that works I, I suppose yeah you've got probably two options adoption support work uh, support fund going to your adopting agency um be that within i think it's still the same within three years it's the one that assessed you yeah. post after three years then it'll be the per, the authority local to you mm -hmm. and making an argument for the needs um of the child that they need life story work i think it's fair to say there is a long wait and sometimes children can't wait so um you know i suppose some people are in a position to be able to commission it if you're not um then they do need to go through the adoption support fund i i saw something from the adoption uk who said that um it wasn't nearly half of adopters have used or have applied for adoption support funding really? which is staggering really but yeah. does see what the the demands are um Karthik's asked um do siblings tend to do life story work together or individually or does it vary individually individually yeah individually because everyone has a story yeah so um 
working. I'm about to undertake some life story work with a set of siblings at the moment, and I'm still working out how I'm going to... They are going to be separate, but I'm yeah. still working out in which way I'm going to have to do this separateness, whether one's going to have to be the day after the other because they see each other quite frequently, but they don't live together. So it's like, oh, okay. how is that going to work? So, yeah. <laughs> That's true. And <clears throat> I think it's... Having worked with groups of siblings quite a lot, you see that their pathway through care, even if they are removed at the same time because of the different ages, they have different experiences. And um, sometimes, particularly the older one who will have seen more and been more cognizant of, of things going in the birth family, will have had, had a very different experience than perhaps the youngest one who's been removed quite early on. Um, <clears throat> I think <clears throat> just mind mindful of of um, the time. So, if, if anyone's got any other questions, we've just got a, a few minutes. Um, if not, if I can, <laughs> chair's prerogative. If I can ask you, Michelle, um, do you see a, a transition in the child? throughout the process of doing the life story work can you see that yeah you do you do it, it's yeah it's really nice and um i i attended a conference a couple of weeks ago and um the some of the research that's been undertaken around you know the um the changes in 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 child the changes in carer and um, the changes in um other say key workers that are working with the child to do life story work the changes in no those some of those workers as well so um yeah you do you do you do see a change um with children in that you know you um kind of see them becoming much more coherent much more able to kind of talk about situations and problem solve um sometimes mm. things for themselves as well um, I mean, um, I'm trying to see if I can, um, so, um, you know, sometimes I, if, if you, if children got difficult things that they want to say to members of their family, you might suggest that they write them a letter, um, and, um, you know, I suggested it, it was coming up every week difficulties every week around a particular family member and I suggested well you know maybe you'd like to write them a letter they wrote them a letter but the letter was um, um they didn't they didn't show me the letter but they took it into school and had quite a lot of swear words in it. um and they seemed to ruffle some people's feathers and then they were kind of saying oh well you know really really bad language in this in this letter and it was like you know you should read it well he didn't give it to me he gave it to you so i would have to ask if i can look at the letter but um, and, um you know you can't look at my letter because it's full of bad words and i don't want you to read them it was like fine <laughs> i'm not going to read it then <laughs> but then a couple of weeks later i was allowed to read the letter but the letter never went anywhere. That letter was just kept, and that was just their yeah. expression of how they were feeling um, about this particular person, and they wanted to just write their feelings down on paper. And that seemed to, you know, that seemed to work. Not even sending that letter seemed to work. So you, so you can see where people are because in the beginning of perhaps our work, we didn't really want to talk about. So we, I got shut down quite quickly when we moved on to a certain member of the family I got shut down and shut down and shut down and so that's a big mm -hmm. shift when you're able to write a letter get your feelings out yeah you know it might not be a positive letter but those are his feelings hey mm -hmm. who are we to say that he can't have those feelings about that person so yeah mm -hmm. it I can I I have seen and I can see um children um make changes be able to problem solve look lighter be happier you know have hope which is the you know the main thing when you're working with some children that are, are really struggling mm. 
and <clears throat> I think more and more um it's the unexpressed emotion and the un articulated emotion and and like you say it doesn't always have to go anywhere but it, but just the the act of writing something down makes it really powerful doesn't it um yeah. and whether or not you know sadly a lot of birth parents and a lot of parents you know struggle to hear what our children say um and and so perhaps actually articulating it might not be safe or or possible um but actually expressing it and working it through working it out in your head actually what what do i feel i think i can imagine that's really powerful <clears throat> so if um if anyone who's um listened to you thinks actually i i, I could really see that you might be able to help um or wants to get to know you a bit more where would they um connect with you michelle um the tls website i'm on the tls website right T L S W I. yeah t-l-s-w-i dot dot com dot mm. i think you could dot com <laughs> right is that a um counseling no it's the um therapeutic life story ah. work um practitioners right okay, website okay. and forum it's run by richard rose right okay um i will like i say i'll i'll send out that link um I thinking as about well. uh, advertising the services uh, <laughs> <laughs> so i've not even thought about that <laughs> <laughs> it's been really good um just before um we we sort of draw things to a close i just wanted to say um thank you so much michelle that's really really useful i hope people um have found it helpful um if you if you have used found it useful i hope that you'll come to other master classes that um happen we and, and if anyone's got any suggestions of things that they'd like us to cover then please do let me know um i'm running a um membership for adopters foster carers and special guardians um called community ohana um and <clears throat> this sort of um training and community is really taking off um we're doing lots of different um activities we've got um, monthly training we've got campfire conversations and support groups um which are facilitated with people who are experts in their field my experience of support groups sometimes has been that actually it's the loudest and most perhaps uh negative carers who um dominate and we don't always get an opportunity to talk about our own is issues so um and also what i'm really excited about is that we've got um didactic developmental psychotherapy course that is part of the membership so we will have um one person who um in a in a household and it's a joint membership so it, it sort of encapsulates two people one of those people can come on the didactic developmental course, which will be starting on the 25th of October. Um, and I know this course has been transformational for families. It um, helps parents um, and adopters sort of understand the motivations of the children, helps communication. Um, and I'm really excited about offering that worth £700 in itself. Um, we've got the anti-racist adoption course um, and um, relationship-based play course, which um, Keely and I did, which is an eight-session eight course to help you use play to enhance and build attachment. So I will be sending out information about it. I would love to see you um, in that membership if you're interested any um, questions then just hit reply and um, email me and um, yeah in the chat if you can let me know 
whether you found the session useful that would be really helpful to have some feedback um <clears throat> what i'm going to do if michelle you're okay to hold hold on for a couple of minutes what we um what we do at the end of these sessions is that um the members of the paid community will just have a couple of minutes with um the expert who's joined us so um thank you to everyone else who's joined i hope you've you've found it helpful um thank you lynn really appreciate it thank you rachel um really enjoyed speaking to you and um hopefully we're not going to do this in august because um yeah <laughs> people are busy with holidays and stuff but um september we will have something um lined up as well so if you're on the mailing list you'll hear about that thank you becky uh caitlin really helpful thank you good to see you. good to see you all so if um members could stay on um just if you've got any other questions that would be good thank you <coughs>